I'm going to begin. I'm going to begin to record this as we usually do every month. I certainly want to welcome everybody to March 8th, 2022, <laughs> International Women's Day. So it, uh, it's a, it's kind of a big deal, and I want to make sure that uh, we don't um, we don't forget that. Um, noting that there's a tremendous inequality, um, you know, uh, throughout the world. And of course, that we have our own inequality here in the Master Gardener Foundation, in which very few males. <laughs> so it just, you know, so we definitely, definitely understand. So where we're at today, uh, today, just a, a bunch of um, uh, March to do's, a bunch of announcements from everyone here. Um, and then at uh, David uh, Lischwager, and of course I've, I've, I can re I see that I've misspelled uh, his name even on our, uh, just on one our, eye. Uh, just one eye. So at, uh, I hope he'll, I'll have to go quickly through his slides so he won't notice that, right? You know. Um, but this is a, uh, um, but if you guys that uh, even while I'm uh, doing the Zoom, if you guys want to have in a separate window, you can go to the Burke Museum and look for one cubic foot. So at uh, David Lischwager is a photographer, professional photographer, done a lot of stuff for Audubon, for National Geographic. And this is a whole series in which he takes a one cubic foot set of a PVC and places it in different places, you know, underwater, you know, on it, on land, underground, and takes photographs of all the life forms that come into that one cubic foot. And so it, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a whole uh, body of work that he's done and it's culminated into a phenomenal book, by the way, a phenomenal one cubic foot coffee table book whose, fo whose photographs are truly outstanding. But more on that when David comes to us. Okay, calendars. March is an incredibly busy month, you know, mm. uh, and we'll begin with the, the happy birthdays here. Jude, I see you're on here. Happy birthday, PJ's birthday, Holly, Travis, Don, Elizabeth and Kathleen. So lots of birthdays this week. Um, we kick off the training last Saturday. Um, Cindy will have some comments to share with us on that. Uh, we've got um, obviously training on the 19th coming up and then uh, the best training session of the entire program will be on April 2nd. That of course, that of course being mine, you know, at the Woody Landscapes. So just a shout out there. Um, study group coming up on the 14th and a bylaws meeting coming up this Friday on the 11th. Reminder also of daylight savings time coming up on the 13th and then spring on the 20th. And then as we've been talking about what's happening on March 12th, anyone? Yeah. 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 <laughs> the masks go away. <laughs> Let's hope we can keep them off. Quick shout out then for study group. Uh, remember, this is the Euro <coughs> for the study group. It also is in, um, uh, Katie just put out an email um, to all the members with that, um, so, uh, with that, with this URL. Uh, the important thing, of course, you remember when you're doing Zoom is the meeting ID, because you can always go to Zoom, log in and put in the meeting ID. And that's the important thing. So it's, um, it's really knowing that meeting ID, 843-1516-1675 and making sure you've got that down. That's next Monday at 1 p.m. Monday at 1 p.m. Okay. So reminder quick of who we are. We're here today as a foundation, as a, as a, as a foundation. Uh, we are a nonprofit corporation, of course. You know, we have three purposes. We are here to educate, right, and inform the communities and inform our public per our, WS, per our stance as WSU, Master Gardeners. We also raise money that helps fund our programs and support the programs we support, we, 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 we believe in. And of course, uh, we're coming together just to engage, to learn. Our 2022 elected board, PJ cannot be with us today as president, but Sabine is our president elect and she is here with us. But, um, you know, and it, uh, the rest of this, uh, we, the, we're, we're filling out here with the rest of the teams. And a um, reminder, of course, that um, Tony, Alina and Brenda you know, uh, our, our liaisons here with the, um, uh, with, uh, with WSU and all kinds of opportunities to get involved and to volunteer. And it, uh, we'll be talking more about programs coming up in which we can always volunteer. Um, and so there's lots of things happening. Okay. March to do's from OSU, um, plant the vegetable garden, uh, Bev and I, uh, planted our seedlings on Saturday. 
and it uh, you know, and so it, uh, we're still keeping them. Um, we're still keeping them in at, uh, in hoop houses, so we haven't planted them directly in the ground. Um, but you can see from WSU, as long as you've got soil temperatures above 40 degrees, we can put in the cool season crops. And WSU reminder that WSU has an ag weather net. So weather.wsu.edu, weather.wsu.edu gives us soil temperatures mm -hmm. and we're well above 40 degrees, you know, in all of our areas. And at uh, Grayland and uh, Long Beach, uh, at, um, bringing in the, at, um, the hot temps here, we're sweltering rather at, uh, at um, 48 degrees here at the two inch depth. Water, no surprise, you know, our water year, October through February, it's been wet. I mean, look at how much more rain we've had than average. Um, so it, uh, it's pretty amazing when we talk to our friends in Las Vegas who haven't had more than an inch and a half in the past two years. And we say, yeah, we had five inches last week type of thing, right? You know, so we should celebrate the water we have, but note that we are having a lot of water. And so that does speak to uh, making sure that we're managed our soil nutrients and worrying and concerned about being thoughtful about um, leaching of nutrients. Okay. So other March to do's maintenance. It is time to start thinking about lawn mowing. You know, if you can get out there, reminder not to compost grass clippings um, and fertilizing. And it, uh, it's interesting that WSU is very specific here is that, you know, in terms of the established evergreens and roadies and azaleas, you know, only if needed. So there's no need to get uh, too uh, worked up. Pruning spring flowering shrubs after the blossoms fade. I'm already seeing bumblebees and it, uh, on our blossoms. And so I'm gonna leave those blossoms up as long as we can because I think we've got a good set of pollinators already coming out this year. Planting propagation, you know, time to grafting grafting of uh, trees and it uh, that could be very interesting and so there's two references here two references two references here on the it, uh, on the website here for how to think about grafting and budding you recall at the Holman Garden Show two years ago right we actually had a workshop on grafting and it was fascinating and it um, and noting and the, the encouragement at that time was that we all should be doing graft it's not such an um uh such a bizarre and uh, and master magical art that we all shouldn't be trying it so at uh, check out pnw 496 and at, uh, let's see if we do some grafting and get some uh, get some feedback for us all okay and uh, there's the uh, the other reference for that uh, that um that, that um, uh, propagation of plants by grafting and budding so this is this is when we really show our metal as matter as master gardeners here can we graft march to do's monitor landscape plants for problems obviously this is so important don't treat unless a problem is identified um, protect new growth from slugs um, this is of course that um, this is where we are internet our uh, integrated pest management um, training comes into uh, comes into play um, you know, given the wetness and the dampness that we've had um, you know at uh, fungus black spot um, is also certainly going to start being a problem um, pretty soon as weather gets warming up. Indoor gardening, type to bring out anything at um, any plants we've had inside, bring them back outside. And it, um, but the caution from OSU is to wait till next month to actually take them outdoors. We shall see. Soil testing labs, a um, couple reminders here. Again, that uh, my favorite is the OSU uh, reminder. Um, it's actually more attuned to home um, home gardeners and it, um, in terms of the references where the soil test can be sent. Okay, so on into announcements. I know one of the first uh, announcements I wanted to uh, really lean into Alina and Brenda on is new protocols for demographic data collection. And Katie just sent out an email this morning, right? You know, speaking to this, um, Alina, do you want to pick up and amplify? You know that this is a, a new process. <laughs> it is. It is a new process. I apologize that my dog's in the background here, but I'll put them out. Put her outside if I need to. It is a new process. Um, in the past, we were able to sort of guess whether what 
race a person was. Now this information has to be totally self-identified. So uh, the handout that Katie attached to the email actually shows you what we're going to be collecting. Um, three questions. What's your gender? What's your race? And what's your ethnicity? Um, and so some of the suggestions are that when you're talking to a person at a plant clinic, you can say before you leave, um, we'd really appreciate if you would fill out this three question survey. Um, we're using this information to evaluate our outreach efforts and see who we're reaching. If they say no, then you just check prefer not to say or unknown. You can do the same thing at uh, workshops if they're in person. You just take take the bottom half of it, say, you know, during this workshop, would you please fill this out and put it in the box in the back to complete, uh, can, to make sure it's confidential. Or if you're at the home show or the garden tour, pass out this card and say, while you're walking around, please answer these three questions and stick it in the box and let them know where the box is. Um, some people are not going to want to fill it out. And so you don't insist because it's entirely voluntary. And then the last one was, if a client doesn't know which option fits them the best, tell them that it's their choice. You could prefer to not respond or you can check unknown. So this is all now the responsibility of the people that are contacting us to fill out this information. And please, 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 at the end of each event, would you please send that information to me because I need to report it. So you can do that either by sending me the forms or you can do it by summarizing how many in each section there were and just send me the summary. That's all I need to know, but I really do need to have that. Any questions? Questions, comments? Someone asked me before, what's the difference between race and ethnicity? And I had to look that up. And basically, because you can, you can identify with different ethnicities. So basically, race focuses on your physical, your genetic traits, okay? That's what we've always done. Ethnicity is concerned with a group cultural identity. So you could be Asian, but because you were born in the U.S. and have been exposed to American culture, you might say, well, I identify with my Asian culture, but I both, but I also entertain, um, identify with my European culture. So that's why they're so explicit. So the key thing I want to emphasize is that when we ask this information, right, this is not trying to, um, uh, um, uh, we are doing so as a requirement because a WSU is a land grant university is required to pursue and acquire this demographic information. But you can appreciate that this is a it's, a, it's a voluntary request of information and they can choose. There's a specific response area in which they choose not to, um, um, not to, um, uh, not to reveal. Um, their gender or their um, or their race or ethnicity. Okay, it's a lot more explicit now. Um, you know, non-binary. Uh, so it's not just male or female anymore. Okay. So any questions? Again, this is a, this can be a sensitive topic, and this could be a sensitive engagement with the public. And this is why it's important. Uh, you know that Alina and Brenda are spending time sharing with us the protocol for how we want to engage the public in asking these questions. So give me a, give me a contact me if you have any questions once you see the information that, that uh, Katie sent out. Thank you. Okay. Another quick reminder, of course, is that, um, you know, it, uh, you know, just like uh, uh, Alina was sharing uh, in terms of getting information out to our members, e-news is that primary resource so that's a monthly uh, resource um, john and katie need to assemble that and they need to have that information typically no later than the um, than the first monday or tuesday of the month 
So at, uh, you know, think ahead in terms of when to get announcements into e-news so that we can ensure that uh, we're not blasting emails, you know, every other day uh, with new information we have to get to. John, you have your hand up. Yes, uh, when I was in college many, many moons ago, there was only three races, uh, Black, African Blacks, Mongolians, and Caucasians. Has that all changed? And the clear answer, um, John, very quickly is that it has. This past year with the 2020 decennial census was the first time the census actually went into, are you of two or more races? And so they've actually become far more explicit in terms of detailing uh, racial background. So what is two or more races? If you are, if, if say uh, uh, one parent is Asian, one parent is Indian American, one parent is Caucasian, one parent is black. Okay, I can understand that. You're, but, so uh, yeah, so two or more races. In fact, they're asking for three or more races or even four of more races. And this is all um, part of the well, decennial census. Be, the races like Caucasians where you look at them, their skin colors go from ivory white to dark brown, from uh, Sweden I, to India. India's are dark brown and Sweden's are ivory white co complexion. So, so that's, that's, why, that's why we don't just say Caucasian anymore. Um, the other thing is, someone asked, well, is this part of the census? No, it's totally not related to the census. This is collecting information on who we reach to WSU because our mission is to re reach everyone and we need to know who we're reaching. So okay. that's, that's what's changed. So our 2022 okay, intern training is underway. We had our first uh, session on March 5th. Um, you know, um, Cindy, um, Jude, any comments regarding the training programs for this, this, uh, uh, for this year? I've got the full calendar up here. Um, any comments and thoughts? Uh, they're a really interesting bunch. Um, our first day was really good. Uh, they were all, almost all of them were very active, responsive to what we were doing. And that's fairly rare. Now I know Kelly, your class, you were all very responsive, <laughs> but really just uh, they're clicking. Like they've been here, they know what's going on and they want it all. Well, it's great yep. that we've got a strong start and it's gonna be very exciting that, uh, you know, come on your next class you won't have to you won't have the class won't have to have mask yeah that makes oh a lot of boy I, it's really hard to to talk to a whole crowd in that big room with a an nk95 mask on it you, you end up being quite breathless at the end of every sentence so it's great that we won't have to wear a mask now, because most of the sessions are at long at uh, up at grace harbor in the dog barn you are welcoming um veterans right to come in Not, no we no. haven't we haven't made that decision it, it depends on each facilitator and we haven't contacted them yet so that's that's a wait and see kind of thing kelly we we think that we would like to to target um uh the facilitators that have a wsu speaker um and that would be and that way the people would get some information outside of of our collective knowledge already they would get wsu speaker knowledge um, but we we need to connect with those facilitators before we can actually invite people. That, you know, we want to <laughs> we don't want to to bring a lot of people in if they don't if they don't if they are not prepared for it. Nor do they want that. So sounds good. So would 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 you recommend um, uh, if an individual is interested in attending a session to reach out to the facilitator to the training facilitator for that session? I'd I'd say just con contact me or okay. at this point in time um, and because I'm gonna be the one that contacts the facilitator. And if, if there's a lot of interest in a specific, specific okay, so, so the sessions that we're looking at are entomology, plant diagnostics and vegetables and uh, fruit crops. Those are the three that we know have uh, WSU pres presenters, but, but I'll be contacting those folks uh, directly. So if, they, if, if anybody who's watching and has an interest in, in any of those sessions, 
let me know. And I'll just include that in my information to the facilitator so that they know that there's interest. Okay. Kelly, okay. I have to jump in here and say, although a lot of people are excited about not having to wear masks, we can't assume that everyone will feel that way. And so we have to leave it open as an invitation that if you would like to wear a mask, please feel comfortable doing so. Good point. Yeah, we we absolutely point. do that. We've been, yeah, we've already mentioned that, Elena. So that's a, that's a good thing to repeat. Yeah. Um, but I'm, I trying, I'm trying to think if there's anything more to, re, to support uh, the, the botany session. You know, I, th I think what really sealed the deal for us on on Saturday is that we spent it it was it was foggy as the Dickens in the morning, but by the time we headed to the demonstration garden to kind of um, uh, solidify some of our knowledge with hands-on um, experience with the with some of the plants, the sun was out. That changed everybody's attitude quite a bit. So it's always sun is always a good uh, you know mood lifter. So that helped. This is Sharon. I have a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. One has to do well, Cindy. Mine is going to be a Zoom, and that's going to be easy because they could they we could just give the Zoom link to the vets and they can attend. Okay, uh, yep. that, that's, part. Easy. that's easy. The other is on no mask. Are we still doing social distancing? I guess this is Alina or uh, Brenda question. Hey, you're not required to do social distancing. You're not required to wear a mask, but WSU wants us to be aware that the best way to keep healthy is to wear a mask, do social distancing, and all the other non-pharmaceutical practices that we've been doing. We still have the flu season coming up, you know. I mean, there's all sorts of things that could happen. So you don't aren't required anymore. But if you choose to do so, then let's honor those people that, that want to do that with social distancing and uh, masks. Okay, good questions, good follow-up. Other questions, comments on training? So I, I do have one more thing to add, uh, Kelly, in, in light of the, um, the net or the, the booster that we purchased. I've heard from the county folks, uh, the IT county folks on that, and I'm going to let you take a look at the emails, but it sounds like uh, they're more than willing to work with us on it, so that's really good. Um, what I think is the best news on that is that they've, they've gotten a hold of us within a week of actually being asked to help us. Very good. So bonus on that, right? Okay, so hopefully it'll all be up and running by the time Jude needs it um, in a week or so. Okay. Yeah, so we'll follow else, up. The, the second best session of the of the whole training <laughs> is the next one on the nineteenth. <laughs> long as we long as we know it's the second best, that's for sure. That's for sure. <laughs> so the um, uh, by the way, a quick shout out for everybody is that uh, what we're doing at the dog barn is we're actually putting in a mesh system, and I would encourage everyone who has a, who is struggling with any kind of Wi-Fi issues at home or in their business to think about a mesh M E S H system. It's a series of amplifiers and boosters that uh, is very easy to connect and it uh, will robustly enhance your Wi-Fi experience. Anyhow, on to bylaws. So at, again, I mentioned a meeting coming up this Friday at 1.30 p.m. This is my fault uh, for not updating this thing. Um, any updates from anyone who's here on the bylaws committee in terms of how that progress is going? Okay. It's pretty cumbersome. Okay. <laughs> because it, it, a one one meeting was just on the first two sections, so it's going to take a while to slog through it. Very good. And again, I appreciate I appreciate everybody's efforts in going through this because it is you know it 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 can be a slog, and it uh, but hopefully the outcome will be healthy in terms of having a robust. Um, cleaned up a uh, set of bylaws. It's important. 
And the good news is we will be doing it every year. So I'm very grateful that PJ does the, the really hard work this year. And so hopefully next year, we just breeze through it, just look at it one glance and say, oh, we're so good. <laughs> okay. Sabine's ready to coast already, already in her role as president. <laughs> Okay, so reminder, anybody willing to participate and engage with that, that's 1.30 this Friday, and reach out to um, either Sabine or PJ for that uh, for the URL. I don't think the URL has been published just yet. I got one, but it says 1 o'clock instead of uh, 1.30. Okay, excuse me, my fault, then 1, 1 p.m. then, yeah. Right, yeah. Okay, um, quick update on it uh, on budget. Um, this is our 2022 budget. Um, Sharon, I know that um, we're actually uh, uh, doing quite well already with respect to uh, funds coming in. Yes, we've we haven't even we haven't deposited all of the money yet um, because we don't have all we do haven't deposited all of the training money, so that makes. just lost Sharon. <laughs> anyway, just wanted to make a note is that, you know, our, our official budget for this year is calling for a loss. Um, uh, we're actually hoping to, at, uh, you know, as, as in many past years, this is a very conservative budget. We all, we always have done better than this budget and it, uh, we expect to do so as well. A reminder, of course, that we have a significant cash cushion so that um, even a loss of this year is not going to impair our programs. Reminder also that the, um, the, the, the scholarship is underway, our, our, um, our, our graduating senior scholarship is underway, applications are available. Um, um, Trish, are you online or anybody from that committee would like to speak to progress in reaching out and uh, activities on that? Trish and the team always do a great job of reaching out, and it, uh, we've had some phenomenal scholarship applications in the past. Looking forward to that same uh, that same program for this year. We have all the way through May first of this year. Okay, big events, of course. You know, the Home and Garden Show, May fourteenth and fifteenth. The Garden Tour in uh, in Aberdeen. I'm told by Terry that uh, we now have the gardens selected. That we have four or five gardens selected for the uh, Garden Tour. And, it, um, and in particular, um, Robin and um, Rhonda, do you want to give us any other update relative to the Home and Garden Show? Can't hear you, Rhonda. Need to unmute. I can't hear you, Rhonda. I can't. She's talking, but <laughs> can anybody Just, hear her? Nope, you were doing great early on, Rhonda. Yeah, but uh, I need to unmute. Well, I think she's got to unmute. I think just, just she's having it, uh, just having a microphone issue here. Uh, but no. Robin, you want to you want to just pick up from uh, there because I, I know that you're actually doing well. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, we're doing really well. Well, the the garden side is we only have thirteen um, booths left, so that's awesome. Um, I think Rhonda's having a struggle on the home side more because of the uh, COVID really did a number on uh, big businesses. Um, well, it, COVID was good for big businesses. I think that's one of the problems. Like for instance, like Home Depot during COVID, everyone went to Home Depot like all the time, you know, those places were booming. So now they don't really need business because they have a lot of business. In fact, more than they can handle, but they don't have, um, they don't have um, employees. <laughs> so they have a lot of business, so they don't really need the advertising. And then they don't have employees to send because nobody is working these days. So Rhonda's saying, looking for new businesses still. So Anyway, she says we're 50% full at this point on the home side, which is awesome because last week, I think we weren't even near that. So she's really been working hard this week because um, we talked about it. Like, what can we do? We, you know, the, you know, the big people that we used to get, you know, they're just saying we don't need to come to a home and garden show anymore. Like right now, it's like, we got plenty of business. We just don't have anybody to send. So we're, tr she's been going out and looking for, local businesses that has um 
yeah, she says Costco's going electronic for everything now, which is is kind of weird. So yeah, we were a couple of weeks ago, we were like getting really worried, like who's going to be at the home, who's going to be on the home side, what kind of businesses are going to be there representing, you know, home improvement. But so Rhonda has been going out and just looking for local home improvement businesses that want or need the advertising and she's been finding them. So that's what we're going to, it's going to be more of than the big Costco, the big home and de home depot, the big, you know, like roofing companies or whatever. So we're just trying to mention Elizabeth. Mention Elizabeth. <laughs> I don't know what that means. Um, I don't know what that means, but um, anyway. So Sabine, you have, you have your hand up. Yeah, I have a question, Robin. I haven't seen anything yet to sign up for uh, volunteering for the Home and Garden Show. And I'm very eager to sign up on the 14th and I have not been able to do that yet. Yeah, that will that will be coming uh, soon. Okay. Um, okay, so I haven't missed it. Yeah, yeah, oh, you, oh, no, no, oh, no. It's just okay. a kind of more towards when we get close to the show, we start signing people up because it's hard for people to commit themselves way down the line sometimes, but yeah. oh, we, you'll have plenty of opportunity to sign up. <laughs> okay, thank you, thank you, because I can't make the garden tour, but I definitely want to go and do the garden show, the home and garden awesome. show. Thank you, Robin. Awesome. Thank you. She says, wasn't it Elizabeth that is doing children's booth? Oh, yeah, 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 she is. Elizabeth um, volunteered to do the children's booth, which we were all for. So, because sometimes it's hard to get somebody who wants to do that. And so we're really thankful and she'll do an awesome job, I'm sure. So. Well, we look forward to Rhonda getting back her microphone. She had it earlier. Yeah. And thank yeah. you. And thank you, Robin, for this update. Yeah. We, 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 she doesn't know. We actually, we shut it off because she talks too much. Uh. <laughs> but, am, but reminder for everyone to set aside these dates, including the setup dates. Um, you know, as we've indicated before, this is a big deal. I mean, this is a big deal for Grays Harbor County. I mean, this brings in a lot of people and a lot of um, revenue and activity. And especially this year, you know, um, gosh, after two years of hiatus, you know, we're incredibly excited about coming back and actually doing a live show on this thing. So, it, uh, and we'll take it, uh, we'll take it from there. Reminder from everybody, of course, that uh, it's time to it's recording your hours and it uh, and it, uh, you know, as we're now into March, uh, let's just make it a good practice that we're getting the we're getting the uh, the give pulse hours recorded regularly so that um, uh, so that we're, we're not in a in a mad dash at the end of the year to remember all these dates and all these hours. So but, um, you know, everyone that um, is encouraged to think, um, think uh, heartily as to what uh, and program programmatically. Also, and, also, Kelly, I have to verify all those posts. So it's a lot easier to verify 30 or 40 at a time rather than 300 or 400. <laughs> there you go. Be nice to me and post your hours now. <laughs> yeah, right. Be thoughtful. Be thoughtful for Alita. <laughs> Okay, we're about to kick it over to David here, but I wanted to give a shout out to what uh, for next month, for next month, uh, uh, Jake Poole will be joining us and Jake is the head horticulturalist for the at, uh, Northwest Trek Wildlife Park. So it's one thing to think about gardening for to keep wildlife out. It's another thing to think about gardening for wildlife. And so it, uh, Jake is actually very eager to speak to us. And it, there's going to be some pretty, in, quite interesting challenge when you think about gardening in an environment that includes grizzly bears and wolves. <laughs> so this is, at, uh, this is going to be some interesting times at, uh, to hear from Jake. That's, that'll be, um, again, our April meeting, April 12th, uh, you know, at uh, same time, same place. So we'll see you then. David, I see you joining us here today. And it, uh, I'm, quite I'm quite excited to have you here with us today. And I, I wanted to make sure I was, I was pleased to report that I'm, I'm, we're, I'm really thrilled, by the way, by the, the book, right, that you have, uh, both this and, of course, your earlier book on skulls. You know, these are, you know, your artistry in photography you know, it just, it is phenomenal in terms of the, uh, in terms of what you've achieved here. But of course, that's just, you know, you know, it, uh, uh, 
you know, who needs to, you know, you, you, you know that you, you've been, you know, accolades or something you're uh, not uh, unfamiliar with. I'm going to stop my share now and give it over to you and at, uh, welcome to our Master Gardener Foundation. Thank you very much. I'm going to just um, see if I can get all the right buttons clicked here. Are, is, are you hearing me okay? We are. Yes. Great. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> Do you see a little green cube on your screen? Yes. Okay. I'll just jump right in here. So this is a little steel frame. The original idea was how much light can you find in a small place? So I wanted to figure out a way to, to frame that and to put some limits on it and to you know, think about what was a manageable sample size. So, you know, one cubic foot, um, it's sort of something that fits into your lap. You could put your arms around it. It's kind of a personal uh, biological sample, so to speak. Cause I've done, I've done many sort of transects that are a hundred meters long or, you know, what's the, uh, these bio blitzes that were done by the park service and, you know, how, and, and, you know, or, or other people exploring, you know, entire habitat types or something like that. Um, and then takes hundreds of people and they just scratch the surface. So what, what, what could you do that you could be thorough about and actually accomplish? So that was the idea. And I'll just jump into... Uh, this is the Fainbos, which is a type of plant community in South Africa. Here we are on top of Table Mountain which is above Cape Town. And we spent several... Is that sound working? Yes. Okay, I'll let it just play. ...days trying to find a 12-inch square on the surface with the highest number of different species of plants. Mm. So we found this spot that had 25 different species of plants growing on the surface. Yes. And then we worked for a few days just watching you know, ants and other insects move through it during the day and the night. And then we wanted to take the sample back to the botany department at the University of Cape Town and look down into the soil and see how many different creatures lived in that layer. But before taking it back, we wanted to do a, a picture that showed the exact scope, shape, and size of the, the sample really was. <laughs> So we suspended it above the exact place that it was taken from and uh, used the cube and we put it right over the, the soil sample. Many of the plants in the cube occur nowhere else in the world. There's a very high rate of endemism, meaning things that only live there. Okay, it goes on for a while, but I don't have all day, so we'll just keep moving on. That was a sample of one. I'll show you a few more of those little clips. So this was the, the sample. I'm gonna cheat here and tell it to show me. So you'll all get to see the names too. Okay, Alice Sundu. No, it hides it, so we'll. Okay. So this is the base, the, the basal leaves of the Alice Sundew. Lobelia. Sedge-like iris. The um, Finbos, the plant community above Cape Town is uh, that it's, it's about, I think it's, 
It's a it's its own floristic region. It's about 100. And you guys probably know a lot more about this than I do. It's about 150 miles across and only about 50 miles north to south. The, that Fenbos community, um, and it's really it has some bizarre um, some bizarre plants in it that occur nowhere else in the world, and some uh, a group of insects to go along with that coevolution that. Um, occur nowhere else in the world either. And spotted ground beetle, leaf hoppers. I'm gonna put this back so you can get the bigger screen. So, okay. A proboscis fly. This is a seed that um, on the left hand side of the sort of uh, material that oily. And so ants will pick this, um, pick this seed up and carry it and bury it back in within their nests and therefore protects it from fire. Um, and then when a fire does come, uh, that combination of that little flash of heat when it does then it to sprout but the the plant uses an ant to protect its uh, seeds from fire it's a pupa this is a wood sorrel Bulbs, there were a fair amount of bulbs in that uh, plant community. This is a rush. Ants. I think this is a kind of, it's a citrus family plant. Jumping spider. And this is the collage. This is all of the, this is the, all the species that we found in that uh, one spot. And I believe, David, this is the kind of the key theme you're at here is that just in this small area, one cubic foot, right, you know, it's almost unimaginable, you know, how many species of life forms are there. Oh, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's, you know, the 113 creatures that we found representing 100 species, um, you know, that it really is just, um, and that's just the ones that we saw. Um, there's many things that would have passed through, um, you know, hundreds of species of insects that we missed. Um, and then, and we were stopping, uh, you know, there, uh, this little, this, you know, you see right here, this little thing in the very center, that little mite there that was living underneath um, these little parts of the seed. Um, so that, and we didn't even really get into the really small stuff. You know, that's the, that's the, the one reference to something really small um, that was there. And so now moving on to New York City, another uh, uh, plant community. This is sort of a second growth Eastern deciduous forest. Bigger view here. Jude, you have your hand up. Do you have a question you want to raise now? Yeah, I'll ask it later though. I, I'm really interested in this Eastern forest. <laughs> <laughs> it's inside. Uh, it's inside Central Park. Um, it's called the Hallett Nature uh, Reserve. It's in the southeast corner. By that, uh, there's a pond there um, that has a little water feature. 
a little waterfall. And the fence was put up there originally to keep people from, from uh, stumbling over the ledge into the pond. Um, and then I think it was in 1939, they um, enclosed this whole little area uh, behind the little waterfall. And so it, it's been, hasn't been stepped on in, in uh, uh, more than 80 years at the time I photographed it. Uh, so I think there was uh, the leaf litter from six different species of, this is a pen oak, um, six different species of plants. There were squirrels all over the place, Eastern gray squirrel. Slugs. Millipedes. Yeah, this is a millipede. It's got two pairs of legs per body segment. Titmouse. Spiders. What was really, what was missing from the insect community were anything, uh, night flying uh, insects. We didn't, we, we spent a lot of time trying to, to find out there in the dark, you know, trying to collect um, some night flying insects, but they, they, every night they get sort of drawn off by the city, the, the city lights that surround the place. Mm. Millipedes, there were lots of these guys. Wow. Um, with the piece that we, the little chunk of habitat that we chose had a little uh, piece of a fallen tree um, in it. So there was the, the sort of soil rotting wood interface that had the, which is where the millipedes and termites were, sort of larval termites. Raccoon. We didn't actually see the raccoon in the uh, cube, but he was sleeping in a tree above and he moved the cube one night. So we're pretty, I mean, we're absolutely sure that that's part of his, he occurs in that one cubic foot from time to time. So this is 133 individuals. Eighty-six species of animals and plants, just in one cubic foot in the middle of New York City, Central Park. Now we're going to go to the tropics. This is a hundred feet up in a strangler fig tree. The strangler fig started as a parasite <clears throat> on another tree um, hundreds of years ago, and now it is the uh, host for all of this, this, what is in essence, a, you know, a second forest, a uh, hundred feet off the ground of the, the surround, the rest of the forest. Are you going to talk about how you got up a hundred feet into this tree? <laughs> I think there's a little video about that coming up. So bromeliads and orchids. Beetles, jumping spiders. Now this is a seed that um, makes itself sort of sticky and, and grabs onto things because this plant wants to stay up in that sort of aerial habitat. It doesn't want to fall down to the forest floor where it's dark. So it's seed dispersal makes it stay it's able to not it doesn't want to disperse too far, is how the botanist explained it to me, why that, why it has the. So this is all from that one cube, it's all from that 12 inches square or some plant that was touching, you know, that had a leaf um, uh, extending into it. 
moths. Common bush tanager. Big hoth moss. This guy's almost two inches long. I think this is this plant. I love this plant because it's. I mean, it's getting chewed. It's got little bryophytes growing on it. It's probably got some several different species of, of sort of mold or algae on it. More beetles, bryophytes, moss. Leeches. Lots of night flying insects there. And the precious wren there. So 150 different kinds of plants and animals. There were these mites that were sort of in the moss underneath the thing, and there were thousands of them, so. So here's the video. So this is how we get up in the tree. Take off the bottom and sink it. Okay, this is interesting. Oh, a true bug. So there were ornithologists working at the lab, and so they agreed to sort of mist net the species list of the birds that we saw in uh, <clears throat> that we saw, uh, you know, land on the inside the cube. Because um, you know the bird, they'd be we'd put something new there, and and uh, the, those little songbirds, they'd be quite curious about it. So we just sat back on another branch for a day and just uh, did a little bird survey. And here we're in a Duck River in Tennessee. Mussels. And the water was so uh, murky because it was summertime and the algae was doing quite well that we tried to do it this way, it just was never going to work. And so we tried doing it this way, and just put uh, plexiglass into it. It's so actually in the so we need to solve it, we need to uh, lift it up. So we do the same thing we did when you planted it. That's right, you have to look at every single rock. So that's how we got that. Mussels. There were seven species of mussels. 
couple different species of snails. There were mine that I'd met for the Tennessee Valley Authority, and he brought uh, his little crew of biologists, fish, mostly fish biologists. And I asked him to, can you provide me a specimen of every fish that you know would swim through the cube over the course of a, a normal day? And uh, he said, that'd be pretty easy because there's lots of, they can, uh, they just set up nets and um, collected some fish. And there was 50 species that he was pretty sure would be there every day at some point or another. Lots of little lovely garters. Long nose gar, crayfish. Little uh, insect larva that makes, um, that builds a case. He sort of spins this blade of grass around himself. A river cooter, and he's got this whole plant community on his back there. That's wonderful. Morea is about 20 miles away from the so now we're going to go to the South Pacific to a coral reef. And we're going to try and find out how many different creatures exist in the one cubic foot of a coral reef crest. The reef crest is a very sort of high energy environment, lots of current and lots of surf. And then we had to find the spot, different spots, and, and looked at lots of locations. But in the end, we settled on this one. If you look closely, you can see that it's not just a perfectly pristine head of live coral. Part of the coral is skeletal. But what's interesting is the highest diversity is in the piece of coral that's actually just skeleton, because then it becomes shelter for all sorts of marine invertebrates and structure upon which marine plants can grow. There was a huge number of things to photograph all of a sudden. So this is a halomita crab. This is a squat lobster, a brittle star. Tropical coral reef crests. Okay. Spotted boxfish. There's a lot of ra lots of wrasses. Toby. Another ras, a larval octopus. So I, I was eavesdropping on these scientists who, who were analyzing coral rubble samples um, and taking, collecting uh, tissue samples to do DNA. So they wanted to have a, a barcode of the entire resolution biological survey done to date on any habitat of that size. Um, and it was called the Morea Biocode. And it was run out of the University of California because they have a field station in Morea. So I was eavesdropping on their work. Um, and the sample size worked out almost perfect because their average sample size is, is basically a five gallon bucket. Um, so one cubic foot's not far off of that. The 
This is a clam that can actually, its mantle, it can put his mantle set and cover its shell completely. Little sea urchin. Sea stars. This one is, a, is going to be, grow up to be a pen cushion star. It's going to be this big thing the size of a football. Um, and it's about a half inch across at this point. And this guy is a half inch across and it's full grown, a Meridastria. Brittle stars, nudibranchs. different species of nudibranch. It's a scallop, about the size of your little fingernail. It's another one, similar size. And you stay, the scallops have eyes. Um, let's see, it's not letting me in this mode show you, but these little things right here, I'll, I'll go and right here, they're red. Um, they actually have eyes. The scallop, the bigger scallops in that are, can be in the Gulf of Mexico. I photographed one of them one time and they have bright blue eyes. Mm -hmm. Little shrimps. This is a larval mantis shrimp. How that's close this hope close up of a Helmita crab. Lots of crabs. There was like a hundred crabs. A hermit crab inside a little snail shell. This is a hermit crab that's taken up living inside of a, the remains of a little worm, uh, a worm that had made its calcified house. Squat lobster. More squat lobsters. These are all just the crabs. So 190 crabs more than 30 species. Species of abalone. This is a little snail that it actually has a shell, but it's sort of a, a vestigial shell. It's, um, it's really tiny and, and it's inside it just a leftover evolution. So this snail does much better living inside the sort of matrix of the coral reef and you know, the skeleton, the live and the dead parts, but mostly it's, uh, it's a, it's a detritivore. So it's just going around eating, you know, algae and other little stuff off of the, the dead coral skeleton. Worms, lots of worms. This is a little fireworm. Those spines are very, um, uh, they, it's a defense mechanism and they're tinged with uh, toxic chemicals as well as being sharp. It's a ribbon worm. It's another ribbon worm and it just unfurls from something about the size of pea to something more than eight inches long. Marine plants, the algae, seaweed. 
This is a bubble algae and a crab, and it's got some coral and algae growing on it too. Some green with some uh, little coral and algae down there at the bottom. So red algae and brown algae. This is a Sacroglossin sea slug. This is a Tahitian butterfly fish. This is a false cleaner fish. He dresses up like a cleaner fish so it allows him to get close to other species of fish because lots of fish let cleaner fish get close to them so they can, you know, uh, help because the cleaner fish will go after the parasites living on um, larger species of fish. But this guy has the same colors and it allows him to get close. And then they do things. Let's see this little chunk out of this guy's fin right here. False cleaner fish are fin predators. So they just come up acting like they're going to do something nice and then they just take a chunk. Moorish idol. This is the male of the spotted box fish, the first picture that we saw. This is the female. Flame hawkfish, common archive hawkfish. Some people, um, why would two, two hawkfish, basically they're the same size, they're the same you know, family of fishes, how could they both be occupying such a small territory? Um, <clears throat> because these, these are not fish that are out roaming around. They, they like that they're sort of sit and wait predators. And one of them sort of had one side of the cube and the other one had the other side. But then when the scientists analyzed their stomach contents, um, there was only a, uh, something like only 10% overlap in their diets. Lionfish. So that 423 creatures, 200 species, Okay, I think that's a great place to stop. If, if, if uh, am I have I run over time or am I okay, <laughs> David? This this is fascinating. You're doing you're doing outstanding here. Um, let's get some questions going here because I guess this is just you know our, our minds are just blown away, right? You know, obviously, is there any just um, uh, Jude? I want to. You've had your hand up the the um, uh, the first year, so please. Are you muted? Are you muted, Jude? Thank you, David. Wonderful, wonderful presentation. This picture that you have here now, it seemed that a lot of the photographs you took, they were alive. My question is, how did you manage to keep them alive? They're saltwater animals, and that's very difficult to do within a lab. Right. Well, it's a lab that's on, you know, it's, it's set up to you know, the water's coming straight out of the lagoon and, and just filtered. Um, and there's these, we were set up, you know, just outside undercover, right next to, um, you know, these water tables that have, you know, clean, perfect seawater uh, readily available. Um, and then when you, if you pick all the crabs off out of the sample, um, and then walk across the street to the air conditioning <laughs> and keep giving them fresh water. They, they live for quite a long time. And we were just, every one of these creatures became part of a, a collection of uh, genetic material for the Smithsonian and the University of California as part of the Morea Biocode project. So I was, bar you know, I was borrowing them you know, on their path to becoming uh, uh, tissue sample, which is kind of harsh, but um, 
the principal reason for the collection was not to take the photographs. I was, I was borrowing the specimens. The principal reason is to be able to look at that habitat at a genetic resolution. Um, so that was a really interesting thing to sort of watch and learn about. Um, all the fish um, that you see, they were all immediately let go because they had already collected all of that material as well as the octopus um, and it, many, many of the larger things that they'd already collected. Um, so that's how it was done. And that's how we, we kept them alive is to, is to give them lots of room um, and keep them away from each other so they didn't mess up each other. Because um, if you put all those crabs in one uh, cup together, they're gonna start um, shredding each other. So any more questions? David, with respect to the fish, then you were shooting them through water. I mean, so you're actually uh, you're actually taking a picture of them while they're in water, and so wouldn't the water be a filter? On well, the, they're, uh, well, they're in an aquarium in a small aquarium tank that's sort of purpose built for. So it's not very deep front to back, so they can't swim too far out of focus. Um, and like the the fish, sort of in the on the very bottom in the sort of across the bottom row on the right hand side, just a little bit in, um, that fish is really tiny. Um, so it's in a really, it's in a small little four inch square uh, glass tank that's only an inch deep from front to back. Um, whereas some of these bigger fish like the Tahitian butterfly fish in the sort of top left, um, the third row down, second row in sort of, that fish is about uh, seven inches long. So he's in a much bigger tank. When yeah, you think looked, of, go, go ahead, ahead Jude. Sorry, no. <laughs> it looked like at least one of the pictures was made of a creature, a, a worm maybe in a Petri dish, is that correct? Yes, mm -hmm. um, Petri dishes are really, really useful. Um, because when, you work, when you're working in that small, it's actually very hard to handhold the camera. Um, and focus and stuff. So what I do is sort of preset the focus, the camera's on a tripod, there's a little, um, the Petri dish is on a little stand that's got a hole cut in the center of it. So the, um, the lens is seeing through the hole to the white background and then I can just move the creature around by moving the Petri dish. Um, and then I can adjust the focus very subtly by just, um, pushing down on the stand that I have that has a little flexibility or lifting the Petri dish up to adjust the focus. Um, and I mean, there was, I've spent weeks of my life chasing little tiny crabs around Petri dishes. <laughs> Good. Uh, uh, I'm curious. A nice picture of a running, uh, swimming, uh, spiders, insects, crabs, you know, worms. Uh, they jet around these little small spaces quite quickly. You know, I'm impressed, uh, David, by the how the quality of the photographs um, in the book, right? You know, have uh, you, you still have this the same intensity that we're looking at here on the screen showed up on the on the pages here. So at the um, the producers of the book have done a phenomenal job, right, of capturing um, uh, the tone and the the contrast, right, the texture, if you will, if, of some of the, the pictures. Uh huh. Well, I'm glad it worked. It was, a, it was a lot of people's time and attention went into making that book, you know, what it was. And it, I think it turned out quite well. Thank you. Jude, do you have another question, please? I, I do. I'm sorry. I'm really full of questions. This is so fascinating. Um, in the cloud forest, you showed a leech. I wondered what they fed on. Um, there's a, there's uh, monkeys and birds up there by, you know, lots. It's very high diversity. Um, there was a troop of monkeys that we saw come very close to the queue, but they didn't actually uh, go down and check it out. Otherwise we would have been able to include them. So, so there's a lot of mammals up there. There's sloths, there's all sorts of, um, there's a pretty, there's many species of monkeys. Um, yeah, there's, there's plenty of things that a leech would like up in that habitat. David, some of your bird pictures, of course, uh, showing the birds in wing, you know, uh, uh, in flight, right? You know, I mean, I can, I can only imagine what kind of speed you're, sh you're shooting at. 
to capture yep. that? I use an electronic flash. Um, so the, the effective shutter speed is something around a 10,000th of a second. Overall, the reactions, I know that this is, uh, we have this exhibit up at the Burke Museum and it, um, um, I've not seen the exhibit there, but I'm curious when this is exhibited in a museum setting, especially for youngsters and so forth, what is, what's the reaction? What's the response from the public? Um, I have not spent a lot of time eavesdropping on kids in, an, in the exhibit, but I've given this same slideshow to, um, to all different ages from sort of kindergarten to high school. And they, there's a, they, they get it, you know, they, they, they have this sort of innate curiosity and affection um, already um, that, you know, that they still have access to the sort of the, the, the idea, you know, E.O. Wilson's thing about biophilia being sort of an innate, innate trait of human beings. Um, yeah, it's, it's easy. Um, it gets a little more difficult about, you know, any, when you start talking about conservation to somebody who's not, who sort of hasn't kept that connection. Um, you know, well, what, you know, what good is it? You know, cause I did, I spent many years working on um, projects about endangered species. Um, and then, you know, then the, 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 you know, why preserve, you know, uh, natural diversity um, is a real question in in the face of you know uh, you know exploit you know <coughs> extractive resources you know this this forest will improve the physical what you know if we if we exploit this forest you know we're gonna you know our the community is gonna get something for it um, whereas if they if you let it stand the community gets other things because of its presence maybe not you know the same amount of cash immediately, but it's it's all that stuff, you know. It's a it's a place to have a conversation, and and including, uh, you know, beauty. To me, beauty matters as well, and diversity is a good thing. Um, and it, you know, it makes uh, the ecosystem services of any habitat more uh, resilient over time. So, all of that stuff. So, yeah, it's it works quite well for any age, I think. Laura, you have your hand up. I was wondering if you have or plan to revisit the same spots over time and compare? Um, I don't have a plan to do that. I think that would be quite interesting. Um, my friend, David Dubelay, um, who's a quite, a, a, He's been photographing, you know, coral reefs for decades, and he's actually working on a project that where he actually can go back and uh, look at the very same place 50 years later. Um, and I haven't not seen any of that material yet, but it's going to be up pretty soon. Um, so that'll be an interesting thing to, to look at for sure. And David, of course, you can appreciate that the audience you're speaking to right now truly understands how much life exists in very small spaces, right? You know, we just, you know, pick up a, a, a scoop of our garden soil, right? And we see the riches, right, of life forms that are there. And of course, to that point, you've just, of course, you know, this, these are the more photogenic, if you will, life, life species, right, that are there. You've not delved into um, uh, bacteria, right, or electron micros, micros, uh, microscopy. Uh, is it any thoughts in terms of it, uh, delving a whole different level beyond the, with the human eye? Um, I'm not a scan electron microscope technician. I've done, I've done some little work in collaboration with with some people who are really expert at it, and it's fun and it's interesting, um, and I think, I mean, in the introduction to the one cubic foot book, um, Eo Wilson, you know, reminds me that I'm just sort of scratching the surface. Mm -hmm. um, the thing about you know the the soil, even staying, not even going to microbes, just the the. 
in soil or in, you know, the, the sort of the, what is it, myofauna, the stuff that lives at the edge of, in the mud or in the, in the sand right at the edge of the ocean and the beach, you know, there's, you know, or, you know, a handful of, I was at this bio blitz um, years ago and there was a guy who was a scientist and he, he worked for the, the E.O. Wilson Foundation who was part of helping promote this idea of bio blitzes, you know, citizen science, engaging the public and realizing, you know, how much diversity they had in, in um, like it was, this was at Rock Creek Park in the middle of Washington, DC. And so there'd been a thousand people looking for 24 hours and they'd made this really great list that had thousands of species on it. And he took his little falcon tube out over to a little stump that was rotting, and stuck it into the dirt sort of near the base of this rotting tree, put the little lid on the little falcon tube, which is, if, you, if you're not familiar with a falcon tube, it's a little plastic tube for, for scientific specimens, it's about four inches long, about an inch in diameter. And then he put a lid on it and he said, I got them all beat for sure. <laughs> um, so, and he was gonna do, you know, do a, a shotgun DNA sample and see just how many species he had in his little dirt sample. And he was pretty sure he was gonna win the, win the list. What's the next project, David? What do you have to next? What am I doing now? Um, I'm working on a story about uh, seahorses. I'm actually finished because the deadline's passed. It's going to be in the uh, April issue of National Geographic magazine. Um, and then there's a book coming out next month, which is about octopus, seahorses, and jellyfish from National Geographic book. So that's what I've been working on for the last couple of years. So the April issue of National Geographic, a must, uh, yep. you know, a must, a must get. <laughs> and should show up if you have a subscription, it'll probably show up in your mailbox in about three weeks, maybe a three little weeks. sooner, maybe two weeks. Any last questions here for David? This has been fascinating, David, you know, it's for sure. And again, your artistry, as well as your intention behind the artistry, right, you know, is hugely appreciated to this audience, right? You know, that really recognizes that reaching out and trying to educate the public as to the richness of species, the importance of biodiversity, um, you know, the importance of all this. Thank you. Jude, another question. Yeah, I do, since I used to, paddle around in those creeks back in, in uh, near Tennessee with those crawdads and things. But there was one thing about the pictures you showed from that stream, unless I missed it, I didn't see any leaves from higher plants floating around in the water. And I wondered why, why there were none there. Was it the time of year that you were visiting that stream? Um, the... It also may be that it was just an oversight on my part. <clears throat> the way that I collected the, that was the Duck River in Tennessee. Mm -hmm. And it's um, the river at that point, um, it's just below, and you can find it on a map, it's just below a place called Lillard's Mill. Um, and it's about a hundred feet across. At the deepest point, it's probably three or four feet deep. And the place I was in was maybe the water was 18 inches. Um, and I just lifted, um, you know, the sort of 12 by 12 by four inches of gravel and mussels and, and little Asian clams that were in that area um, into a bucket and then transfer them into. So I didn't, I wasn't actually, uh, I couldn't see what I was doing. Yeah, it really it was very murky, yeah. Yeah, so I was just, I was just with my hands transferring the material into a bucket um, to assemble that um, little representation of it, so to speak. Thank you. David, thank you so much for joining us here. We really look forward to following you now. Um, by the way, and we were having a, a little question, I guess, you know, um, your own background in terms of the two I's in your name and the two T's, it's got us all befuddled as to what species, what species of human are you? <laughs> uh, I am of German heritage, and it, my last name used to be spelled with an umlaut U, um, but I guess when it was, uh, the story I was told that it was when it's, uh, you felt, uh, at Ellis Island, when my uh, ancestors 
uh, emigrated. Um, I think this was just prior to World War I when they, they wrote out the name uh, in cursive and it was interpreted, the umlaut you got into a double I on a, on a US, type, US immigrations typewriter. Mm. <laughs> so that's why the two eyes, because I am German as you can possibly be, and uh, I would not have taken that as a German name. But now that you talk about the umlaut, yes, we have those. Yes. <laughs> David, thank you so much for this. We look forward to following you, you know, in the future. And of course, with the two I's and the two T's, it'll definitely, you know, we definitely know that's going to be a unique search element, right? You know, going forward. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you all very much. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Beautiful. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Kelly. I'm going to sign off. Very good, David. I'll follow up with you regarding honorarium. Thank okay. you very much. Okay, so I have up on the screen, by the way, additional info, and it, uh, these are all um, hot links. Uh, but I think if you just do a little search, um, you can definitely find uh, where these. Uh, uh, you know, you can find out more information. And again, uh, this traveling exhibit is up at the Burke, and I know that um, Helen uh, has been up there and was very excited about this um, about the exhibit. And it um, so the Burke Museum um, has more information and more background on this. If you can make it up to Seattle over the next month or two, I believe that the, the program's up there. Okay. Okay, so with that, I'm going to...